Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're just giving everyone a few more minutes to get on since we know a lot of you run from your last meeting to this. So we'll give everyone a few minutes after the hour and then we'll get started. If everyone could please go ahead in the chat and write what book you read for this. So there were two books this time around, which is brand new and something different that we haven't done before. You either had The Artist's Way or Modern Manifestation. Yeah, the Modern Manifestation one was Super Attractor by Gabrielle Bernstein. So if you had that one, let us know. All right, everyone. So glad to have you on. We are at one minute past the hour. So we are going to get started to keep this on time. We may have people coming in as we go, which is no problem at all. It looks like people are coming from their other Zoom meetings and their other remote meetings, and we know how that is to click into the software and join another meeting promptly. So thank you so much for being here. I am Erin, and we're on with Kaylin today. I'm going to show my face real quick so everyone can see me, that you know there's a real person behind uh, the book club. Welcome. Today we are doing Mindset and Creativity, New Spirituality and Creativity for the Modern Consumer. And for those of you who don't know us or are new to book club, we're always bringing in new people. Our book club is over 300 people strong at this point. We are EBCO. We are an Austin-based trend and innovation firm. We are a go-to resource for many clients across the world, across all sorts of categories, whether that's P P uh, CPG, food and beverage, personal care brands, you name it, we've probably dabbled in it. We love looking at forward thinking trends. And that's why we did create this book club to bring like-minded individuals from innovation, marketing, research into our book club, which has been going for over two years now. And each meeting, we keep meeting new and awesome people. So thank you so much for joining us today for this topic that is near and dear to our heart that we absolutely love. We hope that you enjoyed reading one of these two books, whether it was Super Attractor by Gabrielle Bernstein or The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. We have read both of them. They are both super inspiring to us, but even more importantly, they really feel as if they are an eye into the world of the consumer in today's world. And now these books were already popular ahead of COVID and being more isolated and how the world has been for the last eight, nine, 10 months. I don't even know how much time has gone on. But since that time, these books have become even more critical. And you will see that in the work that we are presenting today. So to help you understand a few questions, this is what we will be focusing on. What are the forces behind the growing trend of spirituality and specifically in 2020? This has been such a pivotal year. People are questioning everything that they've ever been involved in for sure, and especially looking towards how the world is unfolding into the future and what are their own personal hobbies. And these books really enlighten us in some of the things that consumers are focused on. How does the modern consumer approach spirituality? What products, brands, and influencers are setting the stage for incorporating consumer priorities of spirituality and mindset into their models? Which creativity trends are impacting the marketplace in 2020? And what does creativity mean in terms of how brands can leverage a competitive edge today? So to give you a quick look at how we look at consumers, how has the studying of them evolved? We're very familiar with traditional segmentation, thinking about demographics, ethnicity, family size, and income. But we also added in psychographics and life stage. So what stage of life is someone in? And what do we need to consider in terms of day parts, their career, their profession? And mindset and motivation. So this is a layer into the soul of consumers today, really thinking about what is their mindset? What is their motivation? What are their life goals? And when you think about these things, a lot of it is future facing. So you can't always discern what their mindset or motivation might be into the future without really understanding forward facing trends, the momentum and movement that we see in industries and how all of these things overlap. So we always make sure that when we're setting consumers, we're thinking about what is motivating them, what is behind their mindset. And these books, because of their popularity, really provide a window into that, into that viewpoint. So for today, we're going to be looking at different elements of modern consumers. We're going to be considering their mindset, self-awareness, spirituality, strengths, living their best life, how the universe and the universal thought plays a role in this, the blurred roles of following your inner self and your exterior energy and balance. And right now it is more important than ever to consider the emotional and moral priorities of consumers. And that is what we need to do in order to engage these target consumers in this modern world. 
Yeah. And what I find really interesting is if you, any of you attended our Enneagram session that we did, I think it was either earlier this year or last year, we were focusing on the Enneagram really focuses on what motivates each individual based on um, different principles of the questions that you answer. So you might be motivated by achievement, you could be motivated by loyalty, you might be motivated by being an individualist. So I think it's really interesting with this new concept of spirituality, we see consumers really tapping into this inner awareness. And as you can see by this circle, a lot of it has to do with feelings and self-awareness and different paths to grow that could ultimately help you feel like you're on a journey in your lifetime and you're advancing towards something. So that's a really common sentiment that we've seen with both authors. So we wanted to define self-help, spiritual self-help, and then self-care. So actually with picking these topics, we got a lot of emails just in question around how this relates to religion, how it might differ. And really, we're here to tackle it from a trends perspective. So just noticing that it's a more ongoing movement that we see, especially with Gen Z and younger generations, where we see the trend towards becoming more agnostic, um, and but instead focusing more on spirituality and really connecting with the self and also a lot of the universal principles you actually find in both books. Um, so there's a few categories that really have blurred lines in this space that you'll see a lot of influencers um, and a lot of brands blur the lines on how they talk about these principles and their marketing and a lot of their products. Um, so self-help is really about improving yourself, taking quick action to make a life change. Um, and obviously there's a, if you've ever been to the bookstore, you know, there's a whole self-help section that could be everything from confidence to um, improving your life quality to organizing your life in a way where you're decluttering. So there's a ton of subcategories within that. Spiritual self-help, which I would say both of these books tend to fall into, is really this quest for self-understanding. It's the pursuit of something deeper, something more elemental. So there's those blurred lines and that fuzziness of, you know, exactly what are you ch are channeling? Are you channeling yourself or some universal energy? There's this thought of like manifestation and putting things out there that you want to go for. And it's this idea of ongoing transformation, this idea that we're not static, that we're continuously growing and evolving and really understanding how we can work with certain principles to enhance ourselves. And then self-care, which you typically hear defined in categories like personal care, is all about like soothing yourself, taking time for yourself. It's really big in meme and social media culture where you talk about like a bath for self-care. And there's a lot of brands that really play to this idea of like treating yourself with luxuries and also recognizing your positive attributes um, and knowing when you might need a break or need more balance. So we have some examples here. So in self-help, there's things like the Enneagram where you can understand your motivations and then understand potentially things that might work against yourself when you're, when you're challenging yourself or working towards a goal or when you maybe feel unhealthy. Um, growth mindset falls into here, this idea that we're continuously evolving and we should um, continue this life journey. And then Tony Robbins, sort of one of the founding parties here where he's just focused on self-help his entire career and this idea that sort of self-achievement and individualism um, and this is the way that um, you can kind of take charge of your life and be feeling more in control. Spiritual self-help. So we have the two books here. So they both fall into this bucket where both authors are very much a thought leader in different ways that you can channel your inner self, channel the universe, um, connect with creativity and passion and find some directional input based on the, based on opening yourself up to, the, to those channels. And then some of the self-care brands we have here, there's some in the cosmetic space, um, Moon Juice, if you're familiar with that, it's a, a juice and supplement store based in LA or a chain, I should say. Um, and they've been pretty famous for adaptogens and this idea of they have a lot of cosmic energy branding. So they have things like moon milks and just this idea that your food has a vibrational output. So when you're consuming it, if you're consuming things that are high vibration, you yourself will be high vibration, um, which is sort of a thought pattern across all of these actually is raising your vibration by doing things that are good for yourself. And so thinking of yourself really as an energetic being um, is a pretty common sentiment, I would say, across most of these brands. And you'll see that a lot in the wellness movement too, um, around the supplement industry with brands like Gold. Goop focuses on that quite a bit, as well as Cat Beauty. So Gabrielle Bernstein, so she is the author of um, Super Attractor. And she is a best-selling author. So you might have heard about her prior to this being a book club selection, or you may not have. She's really big on the internet in terms of her Instagram following. And she has a lot of courses that you can take around manifestation specifically. Um, she has a book called The Universe That Has Your Back, um, where she really 
talks about like trusting that you're on a journey and you can channel help anytime that you need it. Um, so she's been really big in this space and she actually started in PR, um, had um, a problem with sobriety. And then once she got sober, she really attributed it's the idea of being more spiritual and being more aware of her behavior patterns. Um, so a lot of times you will see these movements connected to sometimes trauma, sometimes incidents that happen throughout your life. Um, but more often than not, we're seeing just attributed to overall just wanting to grow and wanting to prosper. Um, she really drove into spiritual principles, meditation practices. So you'll see meditation correlated pretty heavily. Um, her TED Talk, How to Be a Miracle Worker, has over 1 million views. Um, so sometimes you'll see language in this space specifically around um, miracle workers. It's just this idea that you're essentially creating your own path by the thought pat patterns that you're having, and you're just having a different perspective on the world. Um, and you'll notice she doesn't publicly align with any specific faith. So that's a pretty common sentiment we're seeing, especially with younger generations, this idea of not really being religious, but and not having a fixed framework or way to think about things, but being more open and fluid. So just like we see blurred lines with everything from gender to identity, we also see it with faith specifically. Um, so this idea that you can borrow certain thought patterns and you can adopt and adjust that. And that's what you're seeing with a lot of these newer age thought leaders. So this quote here from Gabrielle says, I've always known that there's a non-physical presence beyond my visible sight. There are many names for this type of spiritual presence. I refer to it interchangeably as the universe, God, spirit, inner guidance, love, and other terms too. So this might be something that you'll pick up um, with, depending on if you are focused on Gen Z research or you're just looking at trends around the spirituality movement. Those are pretty common terms that you'll hear associated. Yes. What percentage of teenagers say that they believe in God or a universal spirit? Two out of 10, six out of 10, or eight out of 10? All right, lots of answers coming in. You're actually, our audience today is very evenly split across A, B, and C, with a few more voting for six out of 10. The answer, in fact, is C, eight out of 10. And more on that in a second, because that might sound surprising when, in fact, the spiritual. Gen Z, we're finding Gen Z and millennials, for that matter, are spiritual, but not religious. So according to Pew, four in 10 millennials now identify as religiously unaffiliated. Younger generations are increasingly not identifying with a particular faith, but they still embrace this existence of a higher power. So they still find importance in exactly what Gabrielle Bernstein was talking about, which was that there is some sort of presence around them. And around 77% of teens say that they feel a strong sense of gratitude more than once a month. And this is this whole idea of being grateful and thankful for the things around you as a way of being spiritual, which is a lot different than generations before that are really attributing a lot to a very specific higher power. This new spirituality, which is a lot of what Gabrielle Bernstein talks about in her book, Super Attractor, is about showing this shift in how consumers are approaching spirituality. So it's not lo no longer a chore where you have to go every week and you might feel forced into it, or it feels very, uh, very much like a doctrine, but more a source of wonder, something that you can explore and discover on your own, which is a really interesting, in, in our opinion, psychographic detail of these generations and thinking about wonder and finding their own path and seeing what they identify and that the spirituality makes you feel good as a new priority, that something there is conspiring to support you and your effort, whether that's to make something happen in your personal life or embark on a new career path. There is something there that if you believe it and you manifest it and you think about it, it will happen. And so she refers to God as an acronym, good orderly direction. And this is a really great quote that we have here. Alternative faiths and age old beliefs are enchanting millennials, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, showing renewed interest in mainstream channels and on social media networks in particular. Customers are searching for keywords like magic and spiritual at an impressive 525% and 289% more respectively over the last year. So just yeah. really interesting to see what people's interests are. I mean, well, that's really astronomical in terms of search volume. And it's also interesting just to see how our definitions and the blurred lines are changing a lot of these spaces, just like we see in consumer categories where there's blurred lines between beverage and supplements. We're seeing the same thing now in this space. And one of the things that we've noticed, especially with Gen Z and content creation, is this is idea that there's this outward perception of being positive and projecting this positivity out into the world. And that's actually really aligned with 
this new age spirituality thinking. And it's this idea of projecting out what you want um, and then moving forward in a way that you feel that you're going to attract it. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that reinforced by um, the stats and also these authors. Yeah. And so thinking about manifesting, it's this process of turning a specific desired outcome into reality through focused visualization, unwavering belief, and intentional action. So this is an age-old practice, but she does guide through how to do it. Uh, Kaylin, if you want to move towards showing everyone how you too can be a super attractor, especially for those of you who didn't choose this book. Yeah, this is a definitely has a lot of free material online if you're interested in this, but you didn't have this book specifically. So a lot of the practices align with getting really clear on what you're trying to attract. So let's say you want a new job. Um, you would be very clear that you're open to a new job, but you're also open to whatever the universe is going to deliver for you. Um, so a lot of it's not being specific on the how. So trying to pinpoint one specific thing and then being almost obsessive that that's what you're going for is actually co very contradictive to this line of belief. Um, so it would be more generalized, like wanting a job, wanting a partner, um, maybe wanting your dream home, but being open to how that would transpire. And then also releasing expectations on timing. So um, not expecting that because you put out an intention that it's going to manifest in an hour or a day, um, but really focusing on the fact that as long as you keep taking action towards that and you keep showing up, that it'll manifest in a way that was unexpected because you're getting some type of outside universal help. Um, so it's kind of an, it's for some of us that are very logical, that might feel um, very woo woo um, in a sort, but it's interesting just to see a lot of this language around manifesting has made its way into pop culture. Um, a lot of authors and influencers are talking about it. So it's definitely something that is a belief system that we're seeing that is increasing. So in the super attractor book, being a super attractor means that what you believe is what you receive. Um, so whatever you believe that you can achieve or attract is going to be in line with what you do receive. You can tap into this unlimited creative energy. So that's actually similar to the artist's way where you're accessing creativity from a higher source or from an outside source, or even from your inner self, depending on how you define it, you can receive abundance, improve your relationships. It's also rooted in trusting the universe to bring you what you truly desire by allowing yourself to receive it. So receiving is a whole other topic that Gabrielle Bernstein focuses on a lot is how um, she believes that individuals block themselves from receiving what they're meant to receive because they're not open to it. So um, the analogy I could give is that if you wanted a new job, um, but the new job called and then you were concerned that you didn't actually want to work those hours or you don't want to work on the weekends, um, that would be a blockage um, when you talk about manifesting or you talk about receiving an opportunity. So you can see this quote here, I can co-create the world I want to see by aligning with good feeling emotions and directing them towards my desires. I can tap into an unlimited source of creative energy to contribute inspired ideas, offer wisdom, receive abundance, and feel free. Um, so it is, you can see it's very much about positive thinking. Um, and what's kind of interesting is we also see a little bit of a counter movement to this idea of toxic positivity, this idea that there is contrast in the world there are bad things that happen and just being overly positive can be toxic to some people um, and not always the best approach. So we are seeing some counter movements to this as well, but overall still this directional towards just aligning yourself in a way where you're feeling very positive about where things are headed. So we do have a, a manifestation chart just to show how they talk about it in the book. Um, so step one is to make sure your desire is backed by inspiration and service. Um, so if your motivation, um, one of the examples that she's given in her line of work is if your motivation was for someone else, like you want a job to please your mom or your partner, the idea is that it might not happen because you're already blocking yourself, essentially. Um, step two is believing the universe will deliver. So releasing the outcome because you believe that it'll happen. So you don't have to keep thinking about it or worrying about it. Step three is taking action. So this would be like creating a list or moving in the direction that you want to go, whether it's applying for jobs, um, reaching out, networking, but moving towards it in a place where you feel very aligned and very excited. And then step four would be having patience. So trusting again that um, what you want is coming to you and that it's aligned for you. Great. So which celebrity credits manifesting as an influence that led to their success? Taylor Swift, Jennifer Aniston, Timothy Chamolet, Will Smith. All right, let's see. Okay. 
a lot of answers. Most of you are saying Will Smith. Most of you are saying Will Smith, which in fact is the right answer. <laughs> there you go. There you have it, Will Smith. So let's look at some other famous individuals who have long believed in manifesting. Will Smith says, our thoughts, our feelings, our dreams, our ideas are physical in the universe. That if we dream something, if we picture something, it adds a physical thrust towards realization that we can put into the universe. We see Jay-Z there. We see Lady Gaga. There's a lot of celebrities out there, a lot of professionals out there that speak to this idea of manifesting. So it's not just something that is sitting with the younger generation, and it's definitely not a new idea. But what are the forces behind this growing trend of spirituality, especially when we think about 2020? I think a lot of the, the research that we have here will feel obvious to some of you as we all experience this together. So the rise of job stress and burnout is absolutely one of the reasons people are looking towards spirituality at a time like this. We see that more consumers are feeling burnout on their jobs. A large percentage of the workforce is looking for ways to feel energized and for spiritual tactics that will help them stay determined and focused on their goals. And you'll see some overlap in just a second when we talk about isolation. A 2019 Gallup study of nearly 7,500 full time employees found that 23% of them reported feeling burned out at work very often or always. So something to think about how people were feeling before the pandemic even started. Right yeah, now there's a lot of people. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. I was just going to chime in that I, I even read a stat earlier that with younger generations, so millennials and Gen Z both have tripled their search volume for stress and anxiety solutions in the last couple of years. So that's why we see a lot of product launches in that space specifically around stress management, because we are multitasking a lot more. I'm sure a lot of us at home on, on Zoom or on whatever web meeting software we're on, there's just so much more going on because we're always accessible. We're always on demand now. We have screens everywhere. So this rise of burnout and job stress and just overall stress and anxiety is just such a macro movement. We pretty much see across all categories. Um, right now. And that's what's driving so much of this growth towards becoming more spiritual, becoming more intuitive and trying to go within to help find solutions to help mitigate a lot of the stress that people might be feeling in their daily lives. Another one that everyone who is based in the US knows a lot is going on politically. So that political turmoil that's happening right now with almost 73 million people having watched that first presidential debate. So lots of conversations around what's happening in the United States right now, but we're seeing actually political turmoil in many countries right now. We're in a very divisive time about how to take action to sort the world out and move towards the future. And we're seeing a huge disparity between older generations and younger generations with Gen Z and millennials having much different views on the president's performance on how the government should play a role in solving issues that common people experience, as well as discussions around ethnic diversity and what's good for society in general. So really grappling with these issues has increased a sense of national anxiety. Demographics are seeing arguing against one another. And with all this, people are looking for that guiding light. And so they're trying to take their minds off of the news and look towards something that can renew their energy. And that's often found in manifesting and spirituality. We're seeing conversations around ethical dilemmas. So thinking about climate change and how that's weighed heavily on the brains of young people, seeing that reducing carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 and all of these huge goals that we have and whether or not we're headed in the right direction. Dire reports on climate change and natural disasters like the forest fires that we're seeing are seemingly apocalyptic to many. So spirituality is a way to think that there could be a higher power and something that we can look towards to solve some of these issues that us mere mortals are not having a ton of success collectively at the moment. And then there's COVID-19, if that's not the elephant in the room. So according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 13 million Americans remain jobless since the beginning of the pandemic. And we know that these numbers are changing and shifting every day, especially with the onset of a second wave here. There's been a lot of things going on with the schools, which have closed for 1.5 billion children around the globe, which is 90% of the world's population, student population. With no end in sight, the isolation, the closures, consumers are looking for a way to guide them in a time that is highly conflicted, that anxiety is high, and lots of people are playing many roles between being parents, being gu guidance for their children, but also being uh, employees, being teachers, just so many different things at once. It's really, really taking a toll on individuals. 
And then part of that is remote workplace and isolation. So interesting from the Wall Street Journal, people new to remote work often have no idea when to stop. The risk of exhaustion, despair, and burnout is high. So there was a portion of the population that was already set up for remote, but a lot of the population became remote almost instantly overnight. And between figuring out the technology, the workflow, and the household, it can be very isolating and very draining. So with the drastic ticket employees who are now at home, people are feeling isolated. They might forget to even leave the house. There's memes going around that people have taken vacations by going into another room. They haven't left their house in seven to 14 days in some instances, or even longer, depending on their, their own situation. So consumers are dealing with not only that the world outside is unsafe, but inside there's a lot of difficult situations, a lot of conflict, a lot of stress. And this is driving them to look for things that can support them mentally and emotionally during these tumultuous times. And thinking about manifesting in spirituality is absolutely an outlet for that. And so it's starting to be an interesting topic of conversation, even with some of our clients about thinking about the products and the things that people bring into the home and how can we further help people feel more supported during a time like this when that could be a majority of the interactions and access to the outside world that they're having at the moment. Yeah, and even in the artist way, she talks about making a sanctuary space or a space where you can write and do your morning pages and talk with yourself. And so I think we're seeing this idea of a space within the home that is this sanctuary space, this really cozy space, I've even heard of that for children, the cozy corner, um, an area where if they have a meltdown, you can help get them back to a safe place and have them feel safe in a smaller environment. Um, So it's interesting to think we've seen a lot of home building trends and kind of this desire to re-compartmentalize the house. Um, And so it's interesting to see how that trend is like shaking out now that most of us probably either live in an open floor plan or, you know, have seen that in the majority of houses that have been built in the last few decades. Um, So now there's sort of that backwards migration away um, to having a safe place within the home and also connecting that back to spirituality. Yeah, so a key takeaway here is that people across generations are looking for actions and spiritual practices to quell the anxiety of everyday life. And right now, anxiety is on an all-time high, and it's important as brands and product producers and innovators that this is a critical component of thinking about our consumers and how we address them through the things that we create and offer them. So one final note before I turn it back to Kaylin is this idea of manifesting and Gabrielle touched on this in the book, but this is that if you overdo it and you become really desperate and you're trying to force the universe to give you something that you really, really want, these negative forces come together and this is this heightened desire for spirituality and that's called manic manifesting. And this is meaning that you're not quite aligned with the universe and that you're practicing something in and overdoing it and you're finding it difficult to find that balance. And this is definitely an area where someone could be looking so fervently for a specific solution that they're not able to do it based on balance and getting in touch with the spiritual side and being able to incorporate this practice into their daily lives in a way that will actually produce results. Yeah, they call that like in a lot of manifestation thought leaders, they talk about like making a a wish list for Santa or whatever religion you might believe in. Um, But looking at it as like something that you're expecting versus um, something that you're feeling aligned for. So um, it's kind of interesting if you first start getting into this stuff, there's um, some ways that they talk about what can feel aligned for you, which is versus what can feel kind of desperate or forced. So how does the modern consumer approach spirituality? So we see these new ways of approaching spirituality are echoing throughout the world. Um, So one way we're seeing this is manifestation through praying. So more people who identify with alternative religions are turning to prayer and manifesting practices to cope with the enormity of the pandemic. So you can see this Washington Post quote, more than half of Americans report praying for an end to the coronavirus pandemic, including 36% of people who indicate that their religion is nothing in particular. So again, just this idea that there's a lot of blurred lines now if you consider yourself agnostic um, or you consider yourself more spiritual than religious, but just the idea that you can still adopt and adapt to different practices. And this other quote we have here from the Global Wellness Institute, everything that people 10 years ago would have considered super hippie and super non-evidence-based is exploding everywhere. And you actually really see that in a lot of categories, like the supplement categories and Um, the food and beverage categories where there's not a lot of times all of this proof that that ingredient or that product is actually doing anything for your body. And a lot of our clients talk about claims and what can we actually say that this product does for a consumer. 
but yet consumers are still willing to take that chance on this idea of they feel something. They may feel like a mood altering benefit. They may feel this emotional benefit, um, but they're willing to do it or willing to in, try that product without this sort of hard evidence that something is actually happening. There's also this thought of affirmation. So affirmations date quite a bit back. Um, Tony Robbins is really big on this. If you've ever read his book about this idea of repeating the short positive phrase to yourself, it's meant to lift your energy and self-esteem. And they talk about this as reciting affirmations. So it can be part of a self-care practice. Um, it could be even if you're trying to build confidence in a certain area of life. Um, psychologists have long talked about affirmations working um, and being successful and recommending that to their clients. So a lot of times with this thought line specifically, you'll hear that as a recommendation set. Um, so here's some as an example, like I put the sizzle and hustle, I heart me, I rock my own life, but just anything that aligns with your goals or what you're trying to achieve or the mood that you're trying to get in for the day. We also see this reemergence of self-help books. So self-help is quite, you know, it's becoming more of a dated category, but now we're seeing this new energy in life go into it. Um, so you see a lot of modern thought leaders like Marie Forleo, where she's kind of half of a business leader, half of a the self-help guru. It's become this less niche genre and something now that more people are getting into is this ongoing philosophy of having a growth mindset, having personal development, not just attributing personal development to something that happens at work as part of a growth plan, but something that can happen in your own life and you can be responsible for charting your own course. Um, so some other breakout successes have been Rachel Hollis's Girl Stop Apologizing, which was on the bestseller list, um, I think, for like 32 weeks straight. Uh, and a lot of her other books have went on to be bestsellers. And that's one, um, back to Greg's question about B2B, we see a lot of these speakers coming in internally to talk inside of different cultures like Rachel Hollis to talk about this idea of setting a goal and putting your mindset towards it. I think sometimes they take down the spiritual element a little bit um, from what I've seen with Rachel um, and her talks, but overall it's still in the same line of thinking in general. The general principles are very much still the same. We also see this with meditation apps. So what used to be kind of this more nascent practice has now become very popular and kind of an ongoing element of wellness. Um, so there's apps like Gabrielle Bernstein actually has one called Spirit Junkie to Calm. She also has a few where you can just read like affirmations and different manifestation cards um, and whichever card you get is sort of the message that you're meant to hear based on her philosophy um, to also apps that have bedtime stories on calm, like calm has stories from LeBron James about how he gets his mindset straight before a basketball game to stories um, by Matthew McConaughey. Um, so you'll see this very popular with celebrities and thought leaders, this idea that visualization um, and meditation are a huge part of their daily practice. And they really consider mindset to be one of the things that they that they feel they can attribute to their level of success. Um, so I think a lot of consumers see that and think that that is very valid than if they see people who have obtained this level of success and they're talking about it as being a key practice in a way that they got there. Um, Calm has been downloaded 40 million times. Um, it's one of the first, it's the first meditation app you valued at $1 billion. Um, so they've found success in their business model. We also see ASMR and spiritual cleansing. So new types of spiritual experiences are launching, which could be at spas, but we've also seen a lot of franchises that do everything from acupuncture to meditation classes to these new types of sensory experiences. So you may have seen an ASMR video, which typically is where they'll show, um, if somebody's cooking, they'll show a video of like, you'll hear the egg crack, you might hear the brownie batter being stirred. It's this idea that it's um, having this, sensory response where you feel a tingling sensation on the scalp and moves down the back of the neck and upper spine. So these videos are meant to evoke that response. And so people are finding themselves wanting to get to this like deeper sensory state to evoke these more emotional and um, physical responses that can ultimately help with calming and stress. Ayurveda. So this is one that we've seen a lot in the food and beverage space, but it goes back. It's a very old system and teachings that talks about spirituality, life and wellness and how your body constitution, different things that you might want to think about throughout the day. So there's everything from dry brushing, which you might know as a, a wellness trend where you take a dry brush to get your lymphatic system to help drain. There's also things like oil on the hair. Um, there's um, cupping, there's different practices associated with it. And so we're seeing more trends around these practices starting to be picked up and a lot of um, celebrities and influencers talking about the benefits of it. 
astrology is one. Um, there's actually a pretty famous quote from, I think, JP Morgan saying that millionaires don't believe in astrology, billionaires do. Um, so that's a pretty fun quote just about this idea that astrology is a real thing um, that he attributes to his success. But we also see astrology as this ancient spiritual practice that has a really low barrier to entry. So there's a lot of apps and new types of business models that are targeting specifically millennial and Gen Z. So there's some that, you know, give you your daily horoscope, but they also give you recommendations to be everything from personal to your work life. Um, there's ones like the pattern co-star and sanctuary, which are becoming this more modern takes on it um, versus it feeling very dated. And these apps show how technology can become this gateway to becoming invested in your soul's journey. This idea that you could be scrolling on Instagram, find out about these companies and start a spiritual <laughs> journey essentially through your screen, which is, you know, would have feel like would have been an oxymoron just a few years ago. So astrology has undoubtedly found a home among self-care pursuits, such as meditation, healing crystals, yoga, and mindfulness practices. So again, a lot of these practices are correlated together, which amplifies them and gets people to want to try them out. And then even object-oriented manifesting. So crystals, this idea of having good health, having financial wellness. Um, so just showing kind of different tenants that it can take. And then finally, which you'll see a lot in the, um, the book by Julia Cameron, she talks about morning pages, which we'll be talking about more in a second. But a lot of the, the same thought leaders talk about this idea of gratitude journaling practices. So this idea of journaling as a way to feel fulfilled each day and also reduce stress. So I'm curious for those of you that read The Artist's Way, if anyone did the morning pages and found success in it, please leave a chat in the or leave a comment in the chat, um, because that was one of the main things that she talks about is sort of this hallmark that you can do each day that ultimately is going to help um, with your mindset and unlock creativity and ideas. So we see this idea of a gratitude practice really extending and becoming more popular. So we'll end on this last quote here. When you're in alignment with the flow of the universe, you're a super attractor, creating the life you want and attracting more than you could ever imagine simply by choosing to feel good. So again, just encapsulating the idea that everything we just talked about essentially is about making yourself feel better, whether it's a self-care practice, a ritual, um, a thought system, or a belief pattern, but ultimately the goal is to make you feel better so that you're in more alignment. Just a recap of some of the things that we're thinking about constantly as we assess the consumers, thinking about energy, mindset, awareness, spirituality, strength, the universe, and what all of these things mean to them when it comes to manifesting and it comes to creativity. So what products, brands, and influencers are setting the stage for incorporating the consumer priorities of spirituality and mindset into their models? So Risa is one. They're a new wellness space or sanctuary that's based in Manhattan. They offer classes and workshops that are in the formation of the integrated self. So you can do things like career coaching, sound baths, astrologies. We're seeing this huge trend around franchises just differentiating in a very what normally would have felt very niche, but going into these wellness spaces um, and then having a class-based model. Outdoor Voices is one. Um, they're an Austin-based brand. They say you do you is their approach and this kind of holistic feel-good approach to life. Their mission statement is we're on a mission to get the world moving because we believe doing things, moving your body and having fun with friends is the surest way to a happy and healthy life. So a lot of these athleisure and healthy brands are really focusing on overall just this positive sentiment towards feeling good in your lifestyle. And that really goes back again to um, grounding yourself with a lot of the practices we talked about. Goop is one where we had showed them on that Venn diagram uh, being in more of the product space. Um, so if you're familiar with the brand, it's Gwyneth Paltrow's wellness company. She even has a series on Netflix now, if you're interested, where she dives into different self-care practices to test out if people feel anything, if they feel better after doing them. Um, so that's a pretty interesting series if you're really interested in learning more about some of these specific trend areas. Uh, but she preaches the power of rituals. Um, so taking care out of one day to really um, have more of a ritual. So one of her best-selling products is actually these bath soaks that have different functions. So if you're sick, she has one called Nurse, um, where the bath soak is designed to help alleviate cold and cough symptoms. She also has one around detox if you just want to decompress from the day. And on the back of the packaging, the whole story is around bringing back this like ancient bathing ritual. And then a lot of her products have really been thought leaders in the self-care world. Um, so a lot of her product launches and ideas just around what self-care is have been in pop culture. We also see this movement extending to other types of consumer groups. 
Um, so black women mindset coaches have become self-care influencers influencers on Instagram as the Black Lives Matter movement has put racial justice at the forefront of the news. Um, so just kind of showing the extension of this and this idea of really prioritizing self-care. Marianne Williamson, which some of us might remember her um, as being a, a nominee. Um, so she, um, prior to actually, you know, becoming a nominee, she has been a world famous, highly charismatic spiritual leader. So she has written um, a lot of books based on these kind of new age principles. Some of her kind of can consider herself one of the more like founding parties um, in this more modern era of talking about these principles. Like her book, A Return to Love, was very popular. And it was based off of this larger book called A Course in Miracles. And she consistently just talks about this idea of, you know, positivity, um, being open, sharing your light with the world. So she has some really famous quotes that have even been in movies before about kind of having your own personal power um, and so she's one definitely that has been a thought leader similar to Tony Robbins in this space. Moon Juice is one there, which we talked about a little bit earlier. They're an Instagrammable adaptogen brand. So if you haven't heard of them before, I if you're in food and beverage or in the CPG space, I highly recommend checking out their, um, their online store. Over 50% of the business is direct to consumer. Um, their brick and mortar stores are seeing double digit growth. And they have a lot of these products that they connect back to elevating body and consciousness. So this idea that you're super aware of what you're eating, you're feeling the benefit out of it, you're getting kind of this like spiritual glow happening. Uh, so a lot of their products are things like beauty dust, they have like energizing powders, um, they have these cosmic milks that have algaes in them and other products that functionally and will also lift you to more of a mood altered state. Um, so they don't have anything like CBD in their products, but a lot of it is designed around stress relief. So using adaptogens, um, and herbal remedies that have been known throughout that throughout history. Mantra Bands is another brand where they take that idea of affirmations that we talked about earlier, words of self-love, and turn them into these bands that you can wear whenever you feel like you might need that um, push towards optimism. Um, and so they're one, you'll see them in a lot of gift shops, and they have a huge direct-to-consumer brand. There's probably quite a few more we could have put into this category, but just giving you an idea of how you might see this represented out there. So curious, you can answer this in the, um, um, so we're going to launch a poll. So what spiritual wellness product or experience would you be willing to try just based on some of the ones that we just mentioned? Or if you have tried them, you could answer that way as well. A day retreat, a day at reset in NYC, crystals for manifesting, astrology, goop skincare, other wellness products, or writing in a gratitude journal. All right, a pretty diverse group here, although I will say, no one's interested in the astrology app. <laughs> so there you have it. A majority of you are interested in the gratitude journal. And what's interesting about that is that many of you on the, on the line today and us as well, writing and thinking in that way and being a lot of insight and innovation professionals, writing and thinking is pretty much a habitual for the work that we do. And I don't think it's a huge stretch to think that we could be journaling as well. So it seems like a real easy way to get into some of these spiritual wellness activities. So this next book is The Artist's Way. And this one here is by Julia Cameron. This book has sold 4 million copies since it was published in 1992. And what's really interesting is that it's really had a resurgence on this 25th anniversary. It's really come back into the forefront. There's a lot of discussions out there from influencers and social media about this book, even though it's been, it was really ahead of its time. Let's say that the spiritual path to higher creativity. It has a 12 week program. That's all about recovering your inner artist. It's this idea that we can find creativity in all of us. Some of the world's best and brightest creatives have done the artist way. So some that you may have heard of, Tim Ferriss, Elizabeth Gilbert, Alicia Keys. And the book not only created a niche around creativity and publishing, but it ushered in a popular movement of spiritual and creativity self-help books. So like I said, very, very ahead of the time. So we are far more colorful, far more creative, and far more charismatic than we know. And this is the principle in which she bases her teachings and wants everyone to think about creativity and spirituality. Yeah, and I'm just going to chime on, chime in for those of you that read the book. You know, a lot of it is about going back to your childhood interest and journaling out some of the hobbies you might have liked. And what I thought was interesting in a lot of her teachings was about this connection between how interesting we are as children. And then as we become adults, sometimes we become less interesting um, just because we start to narrow down things we don't like, we don't have time for, 
Um, we have large portions of our day, obviously, dedicated to things like sleeping and work, um, where children just have far more flexibility in their in their brains to explore. So I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and my four-year-old's obsessed with every type of insect possible, as well as sea creatures. And he's into so many random things that it makes him so diverse when I think of him, um, where, you know, her correlation to that is as we get older, we tend to get a little rounder, a little less exciting. Um, so that was one of the main principles is kind of how do you evoke that sense of creativity, that sense of thinking, those blurred lines as our brains become more rigid in their thinking and they start to adapt kind of a same neural pathway throughout most of our life. So creativity and spirituality, Cameron's work also takes a spiritual approach to creativity, but like Bernstein, she doesn't attract or call upon readers of one religion or practice. So we definitely see an overlap in their viewpoint about what spirituality is. Life is what we make of it. Whether we conceive of an inner God force or another outer God doesn't matter. Relying on that force does. So some of the practices that, if for those of you that didn't read it, this is a good overview um, if you're interested in learning more. And for those of you that did, you'll, we'll talk about some of the learnings. So morning pages, they're one of the core exercises throughout this book. And it's actually more like a workbook. So the way you approach this book is to read a chapter. Um, you take the lessons, you apply them. And so every morning you're supposed to write three pages of longhand writing. That's purely stream of consciousness. So it should be the first thing you do in the morning. So your brain doesn't have a chance to totally turn on yet. And the goal is to basically do a brain dump. And even if you're only writing your to-do list, um, she talks about over time, you start to unclog yourself so that your brain can start having some natural thoughts about things you might want to do. Some inspired ideas could be new business ideas, new product ideas for a lot of us that work in innovation, um, connecting dots in a different way before our brain has a chance to really jump back to the pattern that we're, we tend to be in every day. The morning pages teach logic brain to stand aside and let artist brain play. So it's, again, it's about unlocking creativity. And she talks about people being blocked. So if you are a writer um, and you just haven't written in a long time, maybe your passion was to be an author and you haven't allowed yourself to actually get back to it. The idea is that these will uh, over time unblock you because you're just allowing yourself just a free form, not have an objective in mind other than the fact that you have to get three pages done. So for artist date, um, there's also another essential activity she talks about a lot is to have an artist date every day or every week. <laughs> every day would be quite, quite indulgent for most of us. Um, it, so in the artist date, what you would do is you would set aside time, an hour, the three hour block each week where you would go to something that inspires you, whether it's taking a walk, going to a museum, a nature preserve. The goal is to do it like a self-care practice where you're treating yourself, you're giving yourself permission to do nothing and to play. Um, and then over time, finding what actually inspires you. So where do you get inspiration? Where do you get ideas from? Um, how, how do you actually want to be spending your time that maybe you currently aren't? Um, so she really talks a lot in this book about each chapter. They want you to dedicate time to both of these activities so that over time you're becoming more and more unblocked. And so there's a famous, um, I guess, quote on the front of the cover from Elizabeth Gilbert. So if any of you have read Eat, Pray, Love, one of the best selling books um, in the past. I think 10 or 20 years, she talks about how she actually did this process. And that's how she came up with the idea for Eat, Pray, Love. Um, so she went through the morning pages and the artist date. And over time, she started to have an idea that she wanted to go to Italy. She wanted to go to Bali. She wanted to go to India. And she wanted to find herself along that journey. So that was kind of the origin of, of her thought process. And there's definitely other celebrities and um, people over the years that have taken this approach and have similarly come up with a product idea or a business idea and have launched it based on this process. And somebody mentioned they love, 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 eat, pray, love. Yeah, it's a, that's a great book too. Um, that's kind of in the same thought pattern. And she talks a lot about her spiritual journey in that book as well. Um, so that's a great one to read um, if, if you haven't yet, um, because it has been such a popular book. Yeah, and another question that was asked was, do consumers look for new products as they embrace these personal changes? We love that question. And absolutely anecdotally in the research that we've been doing, and Kaylin, I know you can speak to this, we see consumers look for all sorts of products. Um, there's so many on Instagram that start to target people. So one big element of manifesting and spirituality is the influencers and the people that you follow. And with the appropriate algorithms, it's perfect for targeting you with different types of manifesting cards, journals, different types of jewelry, other products that really play into those beliefs and what you're trying to do with your life. And we're starting to see that bleed into some more traditional products that we may not have seen it before, whether it's housewares, 
CPG category, um, products that can help support your sleep, like Kaylin talked about, resting, self-care. So we're seeing it trickle in in some of the brand messaging and things that people are trying to accomplish. So I think it really is important to think about this when we think about the new products that we're developing as people embrace these personal changes. Yeah, and some of them are more, you know, some of them are mild. I mean, obviously, some of the concepts we're talking about here, some people would definitely still qualify. This is very like woo-woo and new age. Um, but when we look at wellness as kind of this more macro category, there's different ways to define it. So there could be financial wellness, emotional wellness, fitness, um, healthcare. And within those, we're definitely seeing different business models that touch on a lot of these fuzzier principles, this idea of, you know, having coaching for emotional benefits, having financial wellness and um, coaching yourself towards your goals. Um, so I think there's different ways that those companies tackle those things in their marketing and also how much they're correlating it to more of a fuzzy kind of emotional space benefit versus something more functional, uh, but definitely something we see across in a lot of new business models. I would say ones that are primarily online, there's a lot more education and marketing that goes into this wellness side. And sometimes with a lot of service-based businesses, we're seeing um, this sort of as an add-on and the types of services they offer. So we actually tried this company called Sakara Life. They do plant-based meal subscriptions. And one of the things that they do is they actually have themed weeks. So one of the weeks they actually had um, a wellness coach on call that you could connect with as you were eating your food throughout the week. If you had nutrition questions, if you um, maybe um, have just emotional, the emotional impact food has on you. And so I thought that's interesting that they're kind of tying in this wellness aspect to your diet and how you feel. And they talk a lot about the energy of the food um, and why you should eat high vibrational food. So that's kind of part of their branding, but it's interesting to see how that then becomes integrated through service and product extensions. <laughs> so there's a quote from Julia Cameron. I have learned as a rule of thumb, never to ask whether you can do something, say instead that you're going to do it, then fasten your seatbelt. The most remarkable things will follow. So that's pretty common in manifestation to just, once you decide that you want to go down a certain path, you just start doing it and you start taking the steps and ultimately you trust that you're going to get more answers as you go, which even from a very logical perspective, as you start you know, if you're going to buy a house, if you start applying for a mortgage, contacting um, brokers, you start talking to a real estate agent, things are going to start moving in that direction. Um, so very similar in the manifestation world where you start doing things that align with the thing that you want to achieve. So we're going to go through this back section quite quickly to wrap up here. But I do love this question. Why is there an uptick in interest among consumers surrounding creativity in 2020? And I'm pretty sure that the answer seems pretty obvious, but the world is different for this generation. They have too many inputs and how to find themselves to figure out what matters to them. They understand that honing creativity is one of the only things that technology can't take from them. So looking at this next slide again, creativity trends in the modern consumer. So consumers are experimenting and looking for activities that are artistic and novel. These projects and hobbies serve as creative outlets and de-stressors. Again, back to those original reasons why people are really investigating these things this year specifically. Embracing new routines causes consumers to shop in new aisles. And all of this is leading to a major shift in consumers' priorities around creativity. So we'll talk about some of the creativity trends that are impacting the marketplace in 2020. Um, so we see, especially, I'm sure all of us could talk about an activity that we've taken on. So if you've, if you've tried anything fun during COVID at home, whether it's a craft, please drop it in the chat. Um, we know everything from like sourdough starters to if you've seen those gorgeous focaccia breads where people line up herbs to make it look like a garden. Um, and so we're seeing that this idea that when we have more time, there's more time for things like baking, gardening, arts and activities, and that can be a way to manage stress um, and kind of reignite creativity. Somebody mentioned paint by number and cooking. That's great. Um, so baking is one category that we've seen a lot of growth in during this time. Um, the popularity of baking is reflected in shelves at the supermarket where baking powder has seen a 450% increase in demand compared to this time last year. Probably similar statistics to also things like yeast, which was sold out um, at most places across the country. So you can see some of the products here with home baking kits um, and creating new products that really um, cater to the consumer who's spending more time at home. Um, in the kitchen, we see this. Um, so whipped coffee was a huge trend um, that started during a quarantine TikTok on quarantine and on TikTok specifically. Um, so using coffee whippers, which could be manual or even products now are being designed to help achieve that effect. So we see sort of this like textural intrigue and this idea of, of trying more things at home, embracing time in the kitchen. 
And the demand for kitchen appliances is at an all-time high. Some stores are selling floor models in order to keep up with demand. Novel devices are also in demand, like this Philips electric pasta maker. I've seen this everywhere on my Instagram feed, um, people talking about this. Um, you can actually add flour and water to this, and it makes pasta instantly for you. Um, so it, just seeing more specialized device innovation and um, consumers focused on kind of getting to these more these things that they normally would go to a restaurant for, but now they're doing it inside of the home. We also see this applying to things like home decor. Um, so there's a lot of services like Havenly and other types of online interior design services that are focusing on revamping your home during this time. And that goes back to even like carving out a specific sanctuary space or just a creative or office space for a lot of us trying to figure out where that might be. Um, thanks to the e-commerce boom and consumers constantly rezoning and redecorating, we see companies like Wayfair really thriving in the pandemic. And so I, we won't go over all of these just due to time, but I'll just kind of briefly touch on some of these. So indoor gardening has been a huge um, growth driver. So companies that sell things like indoor plants um, and the sill is one where they've sold more than 500,000 plants in the last year. Um, and a lot of it's on specific things like low maintenance plants, but plant the plants are still real. So they're providing that emotional benefit to consumers. And then arts and crafts, which we just talked about in the chat a little bit, but um, we're seeing a lot of correlation with doing an art and craft and the emotional benefits that that can play um, and a lot of business models that are specific for kids and parents together. So yeah, some of you have mentioned some of the activities that you've done, but um, definitely feel free to chime in if there's any more. So what does creativity mean in terms of how brands can leverage a competitive edge today? Um, so we see this idea of make it or break it. The biggest disruption of our generation has made it so business owners are forced to innovate. Nothing is more important than having a creative mindset. I mean, how much have we seen that during the pandemic with all of the restaurants having to innovate, these to-go cocktail kits, these outdoor dining setups, the plexiglass everywhere, but also this really cool business models that have come inside of the home, a lot of virtual classes and activities. Research shows that 80% of people see unlocking creative potential as key to economic growth. Only 25% feel that they're living up to their own creative potential. Um, and we definitely have seen that with a lot of tech thought leaders talking about how creativity is really this last frontier that we have um, as humans and thinking about how we can foster it and really stoke creativity. We also see creativity as a resource. So robots are great at optimizing ideas, but organizations need creative employees who can con conceive the solutions of tomorrow. So strengthening a soft skill like creativity is one of the best investments that we can make in our careers. And I feel like that's a lot of the artist ways, really just building that creative skill set by finding ways that you can tap into your creativity and your idea generation um, and doing it in a way where you're doing it before your brain is cluttered with your to-do list. And then creativity is the future. So the rise of AI is making a soft skill like creativity increasingly important as it's precisely the type of skill robots can't automate. That's why 57% of senior leaders say, say soft skills are more important than hard skills, making creativity one of the most sought after qualities in a job candidate. So we're definitely seeing this, this heat up conversation around creativity and a lot of this soft skill development. And I think a lot of times when we see with younger generations, they're becoming experts in things that are non-traditional career paths. So, you know, being an expert YouTuber on Lego creation or, you know, talking about very specific cosmetics and lighting. So we're seeing people forge their own career paths based on things that they're cobbling together and creating their own personal development path versus just going down a very traditional one. Um, artificial intelligence has gradually come to dominate so many industries and processes, completely permeating our everyday life. Creativity is the last function of the human brain that can't be automated, and therefore we predict that it will remain in an area that continues to evolve in complex and ever-changing ways. Um, so I think we're just kind of really at the boom of the start of the, this trend. Um, I expect that we're seeing much more thought leaders talking about creativity, unlocking learning potential, how we can stretch into new frontiers of the brain, and maybe some of that will even be through technology aiding us. Um, so we'll end on this last note that nurturing the creative mind. Um, so creating a safe place for employees is key to elevating their ability for innovation. To feed creativity, the growth mindset is key. This idea that we're continuous to grow, um, that we can continue to learn things, that we don't have all the answers already, and that we can be open to finding the answers through a process or through, um, through ourselves even. People with a growth mindset possess an underlying belief that they can improve through their own effort. Um, so this idea that you can um, be in charge of this growth plan, that you can find new ways that you can, um, that you can achieve the growth that you're looking for. 
by embracing your own creativity and the potential of your team, you can unlock new product opportunities that will fulfill obviously consumer desire for products and new service models, but also thinking about how creativity and positive mindset are really part of the new generations that we're seeing and how increasingly we're seeing that start to permeate pop culture and different awareness. All right, there you have it, everyone. Thank you so much. Please reach out as always to learn more about what Ebco does or to let us know if there's anything that you are working on that we can support you, especially as the year 2020 comes to a close and you are preparing your research projects and your innovation programs for 2021, looking at new ideas and budgets and things like that. We're always happy to collaborate. We're so appreciative for everyone coming on today to be part of our book club, one of our most favorite things to do. And we will be in touch about future book clubs and hopefully have the opportunity to meet some of you more personally. Thank you so much.